Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagam Radian here in Northern Virginia where we're covering the Surface Navy Association's 30th Annual Conference and Trade Show. Our coverage here is sponsored by Leonardo DRS and we have with us retired United States Navy Vice Admiral Tom Copeman who is the uh, Vice President for uh, Air Warfare Systems for Raytheon Missile Systems, uh, former commander of Naval uh, Surface Forces. Sir, always great seeing you. Great to see uh, you, Vago. And, and hope you're having a productive SNA. We are having a very productive SNA. We have some good meetings so far. Um, you know, get a a lot of formal business done, but the, the contacts are always what the key for these shows are. Yeah, so it's been good. And and uh, I know you uh, enjoyed your uh, very long, fruitful career in the Navy, but you have a, a slightly more relaxed stance than you did when you were uh, when when you were uh, yeah. boss of uh, of uh, Naval Forces. Yeah. But what I want to ask you specifically is, uh, you know, CNO uh, Richardson. One of his priorities is cross-domain integration. That's something that all naval leaders have worked toward. But in in this particular case, you know, everybody is taking that very very seriously to develop a given the kind of threats the nation is facing cross-cutting uh, air, land, sea, cyber. Everybody's working to figure out, you know, how, how do we you know, sail and help the Navy get to a better place when it's doing that. Each one of the warfare barons, I've had an opportunity to talk to uh, General uh, Kaufman, but as well as Admiral Boxall, mm -hmm. have talked about how they're bringing their organizations, even though they're still by together. Talk to us a little bit about a company like Raytheon. You guys do everything from cyber to missile to radars to uh, everything in between. Talk to us a little bit about how you're trying to think through this space yeah. and the kind of solutions you're trying to present to the Navy at a time when it's really trying to take a look at what that future holds certainly so you know the the five domains land sea air space and cyber uh, in the modern era modern warfare era, there's it's impossible to separate those two you're intertwined um, the surface Navy I think in particular has always operated they operate in the undersea the surface uh, the amphibious forces operate in the in the land domain and they do it been doing it for many many years so I, I think the emphasis now uh, is that weapons are very sophisticated, our enemy's weapons are very sophisticated, they're becoming more and more expensive. So you have to decide how you best use them. Do you have them spread out enough? That's part of the distributed lethality discussion that's been going on for the last couple of years. Um, are your weapons able to perform more than one mission? I think Raytheon has a couple of great examples where the Tomahawk cruise missile, for example, we've taken in the Maritime Strike Tomahawk uh, we've taken the land attack block for cruise missile and uh, we'll be converting them to and I ship cruise missile with a multi-mode seeker on it. So you're taking a weapon that's already integrated on over 150 ships and submarines and making it a land attack weapon and an anti-ship cruise missile. It's very, very effective. Um, the SM-6 is another example where we have taken a missile that was originally designed to be uh, a long-range surface-to-air missile where it's now a long-range surface-to-air missile, it's a long-range surface-to-surface missile, uh, and it's a long-range theater ballistic missile defense missile. So um, if you had three separate missiles doing those three separate missions, you eat up real estate, limited real estate on VLS ships, uh, and I think you'd probably end up, you know, missiles, missiles cost money, and if you had three separate missiles, I'm sure the sum of those three missiles would be more than one SM-6, for example. Um, well, let me uh, uh, like pick on that um, a little bit. Sure. So one of the questions is uh, volume, right? For any of these systems, they're very, very expensive systems, and we have an X production volume, and one of the complaints the Navy has had is, and is working to address is stockpiles. You know, how do we increase that magazine capacity where in the event of a crisis, you know, especially against China, for example, which has all of these layered different missiles, it's unlikely they're going to fire a handful of missiles at you. You may have a lot of missiles coming at you. So it's a two-part question. What are you guys doing to look at both taking cost out of it to be able to, be, you know, have, have the customer be able to buy that volume that they need, and also on the industrial base and supplier management side of things, as you're beginning to become a missile for all seasons, that demand is also going to, going to go way up. Talk to us a little bit about what you're doing to take cost out of it, but also to be able to increase that production volume, given that in a couple of years, the Navy wants to have a lot more significant volume coming into its inventory. Certainly, so one of the, one of the initiatives that we do to reduce cost is to increase the amount of common parts that we use between missiles. And the ESSM Block II, which will be an active missile, uh, the SM-6, which is an active missile, the AMRAM, which is an active missile, all share many similar processing components in, in some of the radar technology and some of the software. And that's, that's where a big cost component goes in. So the more of those that you're building uh, annually, the, the cheaper that you can get these weapons to the U.S. customer. Another aspect of it is our uh, partnership with the Air Force and the Navy in particular in selling 
these missiles in the FMS, to sell them to our allies and partners. It increases our joint war fighting capacity and it lowers the cost of the missiles because we're building more missiles per year. And, and that's really the key to, to if you're building 30 or 40 missiles a year, they're going to be expensive. And I, I, I don't think any contractor out there could could uh, reduce the cost significantly. But if you're building a couple of hundred or 300 or 400 or 500, then your costs start, the cost curves start moving in the right direction. And do you guys have the capacity to be able to get that delivery rate, which the Navy is looking at in the next sort of three, four, five year time frame? We have significant capacity to up our rates in almost every one of our production lines. Most of the production lines are at minimum sustaining rate. And it's primarily due to funding issues within the Department of Defense. So, so we do have the capacity in almost every one of our products at Raytheon Missile Systems to, to drastically increase the, the numbers that we make. For example, the paveway, uh, we went from about less than 1,000 uh, paveway kits a month to over 5,000 paveway kits a month in about a year. Um, let me ask you about the Naval Strike Missile. Uh, two of your competitors are out of that competition. You guys are partnered with uh, 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 Kongsberg, uh, Norway's, uh, with the Naval Strike Missile, which is their uh, platform, but you guys have partnered on that to bring it to the U.S. Navy to increase the reach and the lethality of the littoral uh, combat ship uh, force. Uh, obviously, that platform uh, will, has the 30 millimeter gun on it, but also uh, has Hellfires that are being integrated onto it. Talk to us a little bit about that partnership and what gives you the edge because even though there are two competitors, Lockheed and Boeing, that are out of it, there are still some other guys that are in there. Saab has uh, the RB uh, weapon that it has. The Israelis uh, have uh, a product also that could, uh, is very capable. Talk to us about what you think gives you guys the edge in this competition. Well, I mean, I think what gives us the edge is that we, we meet every single one of the Navy's criteria on a missile that's already developed. It's the first real uh, fielded operational fifth generation anti-ship cruise missile. In addition to anti-ship cruise missile, it can hit stationary targets ashore, which gets you back into, hey, this is another missile that uh, you get two missions for the for the price of one. Um, and so I, th I think that's a, a key uh, discriminator amongst the other offerings. Bring us up to speed on AMDR. I mean, that was a very, very big win a couple of years ago. You guys are still pushing ahead on that program, you know, in terms of the future ballistic missile defense capability for the United States Navy, but also cyber, which is a key corporate priority. Uh, Tom Kennedy, CEO, has focused a lot of resources on that, about building cyber in from the beginning of systems. And if you look at so many of our naval systems, not everything is integrated cyber from the very beginning and is, is very much of an applique. Bring us up to speed on both of those pieces. So the the AN, the, S, the SPY-6, the AMDR, um, is undergoing operational tests. It's, it's moving along nicely. It's on track to integrate on the Flight 3 DDGs when they start coming out. We think the, the GAN technology that's using that is going to be a leap uh, in both range and discrimination over existing radars and really uh, expand the battle space in which the, the Navy can uh, defend carriers at sea, amphibious strike groups, or, you know, port areas, and et cetera, so it, it's going along well. Uh, in the cyber realm, uh, Raytheon has invested a lot of money. We, we purchased uh, Forcepoint, which was a primarily a commercial cyber company, um, IDE, the integrated, uh, the code center at Dulles uh, is a very sophisticated facility that can take weapons, combat systems, communication gear, and run cyber uh, uh, vulnerabilities against um, those systems for our, our customers in the U.S. military and then design fixes to, to make them more cyber secure and more cyber resilient. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a big. A bit, it's been a big emphasis for our corporation, and and it's a, it's an extraordinary center. I mean, we had an opportunity to tour it uh, last year, and it was really incredible the kind of capabilities and and they they, they have that uh, uh, systems to keep a virus actually from escaping, which is which is kind of a terrifying prospect if you think because you guys are actually yeah. practicing with with some very very real world. Um, as you look at uh, the the Latin last question, you know one of one of one of your roles is uh, because of your experience to sort of look forward and anticipate and help the company anticipate some things that are coming down, yeah. especially when it comes to naval warfare. We heard from the CNO yesterday about the kind of very contested space, and I think everybody uh, in this conference and over the last several conferences uh, and, and even through your 
tenure yeah. was like, hey, look, there are real emerging threats and real capabilities that are going to be out there. What are some of the things that you guys are anticipating? You know, where do you expect the puck to be and how you guys are positioning Raytheon to be there and to be ready when, when say, whether it's in the five or 10 year period, you know, you guys, you know, where are you guys looking to bolster your capabilities and be ready to give the Navy what it needs when it needs it? So, so we're, we're working in a number of areas to help the, the Navy and the Air Force, because when you, when you talk about um, the Western Pacific or, or the Pacific in general, I mean, it's, it's more than just a naval theater, it's, a, it's, it's an Air Force theater as well. Um, we are heavily involved in all of the activities of the third offset, hypersonics, counter hypersonics, um, cyber, uh, electronic warfare, non-kinetic uh, ways to defeat incoming threats. I mean, there it doesn't always necessarily have to be a hit to kill type of missile or a hard kill. There's other methodologies of, of defending your forces and your, your bases. And so we're, we're heavily involved in all of those arenas across the company. Tom, thanks very much. Yep. Hope you have a successful right. uh, SNA. Thanks, thank you, Bob.